Scanning. Identity confirmed. Signal acquired. Initiating transmission. Stand by. Contacting Imperial High Council. Initiating project story time. Greetings, members of the Imperial High Council. Today we continue our look at Star Trek Enterprise. We start off with a little something for the ladies. Ooh. Archer is showering and a ship malfunction causes him and his bathwater to start floating. Archer contacts the bridge to find out what's happening. Reed relays that the gravity plating has failed and it should be back momentarily. On cue, Archer comes crashing down on his butt. End scene. This episode's teaser is not long, not even a full minute and it doesn't really tell us much about what's going on in the episode. Ship malfunctions are pretty standard fare in Star Trek. After the titles, Phlox and T'Pol are having a character moment. They're in the mess hall, again, eating, and Phlox encourages her to try more human food. T'Pol won't budge. She's no different from the average human two-year-old or the average 38-year-old cybernetic fox. Yes, dear. T'Pol orders some carbonated water and gets black goo instead. Reminds me of my last trip to Burger King. Random malfunctions seem to be happening all over the ship. The next scene continues with Trip in engineering addressing a bunch of different issues. We're getting reports from Sea Deck that it's down to 12 degrees. Ensign Almack is working on it. Well, tell them to hurry up. If the relays up there get too cold, they're going to start cutting out on us. Why aren't the relays able to work in cold temperatures? You're on a spaceship! There's no heat out there! What if there's a hull breach on that deck? All the air and heat get blown out and what are you left with, you morons? Archer then comes by to check on things and asks if they should drop out of warp since there are so many malfunctions. Tucker says, nah, I got this. Then on cue, a panel explodes. Tucker has to call to the bridge with his tail tucked between his legs and asks that they drop out of warp. You can almost hear the wah, 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 wah. On the bridge, T'Pol figures out something is distorting their wake pattern. Since whatever is causing this is not visible, Archer decides to ignite the plasma. They then catch a glimpse of a cloaked ship hitchhiking behind them. Enterprise then makes contact with this ship of non-hostile aliens, for once. The aliens explain that their warp core is offline and they are using Enterprise's warp field to charge their engines... somehow. We then cut to sickbay. Trip is meeting with Dr. Phlox. He is going over to the alien ship to help repairs and needs to prepare for the foreign environment. He's injected with a bunch of drugs and then sent over to a decompression chamber. The chamber starts to fill up with a cloudy gas that burns. Trip starts to freak out because apparently no one told him about this part of the process. Trip calls Archer to complain and Archer tells him everything's going according to the procedures. Yeah, apparently Archer didn't tell Trip any of this information. Captain of the year. Once the decompression is finally completed, Trip then enters the alien vessel and... Uh, looks like a 70s art house, complete with green shag carpeting. Hmm. We also get a look at the aliens, and they look like this. Eh. Trip is having a hard time adjusting to the environment and is basically, well, tripping. The aliens insist that he get some rest, but Trip wants to start working right away. Since they're stupid, they take him down to the engine room. I suppose they think it's perfectly fine to have a disoriented and confused guy start working on their engine, which is basically a giant bomb. What's the worst that could happen? Trip tries to work, but he can't concentrate with all the lights and noise. He calls over to Archer again, telling him that he feels terrible, and he begs to come back to Enterprise. All of the thingamabobs and dickumdockums and whirligigs are just too much for him to handle. Archer talks to the aliens, and they tell him that getting some rest will really help Trip to acclimate. Archer then tells Trip to take a nap. 
After some shut-eye, Trip wakes up and the lady engineer, Ah Len, is in his room. She asks him how he is doing and offers him some of the food that grows on the ship's walls. Trip declines. Can't say I blame him. She then offers him something that is close to water. This is the closest we could come to water. What? I don't know why they can't make water when they can make protein and carbs. Water is just oxygen and hydrogen. Not exactly complicated or scarce in the universe. Trip gets back to the engine room and repairs seem to be going smoothly. He takes a moment to annoy to Paul and I'm okay with that. Alon then takes a break with Trip on their party city holodeck. I suddenly have the desire to hunt down Lisa Frank products. Alon shows off the capabilities of the holodeck. She shows him her homeworld, which Trip can touch and smell. Oddly enough, her home planet is very dry, rocky, and barren. This is a bit surprising considering their ship is covered in greenery and fish tanks. I would have thought to make the spaceship more comfortable, you'd make the environment similar to the home planet, but whatever. Trip is very impressed by all this. Alain then changes the environment, and they're instantly on a space gondola ride in the middle of the... Well, they don't have water on their world, so I don't know what this is. The acid lakes from the never-ending story, perhaps? Alain invites Trip to play a game with her. They each place both their hands into a bowl of pebbles, and they can share thoughts and feelings. Alain says that Trip's favorite food is catfish. Trip is able to know that her favorite food is a type of root. Tree hugger. They then go back and forth for a while, learning about each other. I gotta say, though, Alain describes this all as a game. Is intimacy a game to this species? Once repairs are complete, Trip makes his way home. They say their goodbyes and go their separate ways. Well, that was a short episode, but a nice little story. Two ships passing in the wind, nice and simple. Huh? What? 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 <sighs> so we cut to the mess hall. Again, eating. Trip sits with Reed and then discovers a weird growth on his wrist. Reed thinks it might be highs, but Trip then says, Well, clear bio scan. Trip goes to sick bay. Flox takes a look at the bump, but he doesn't think it's an allergic reaction. Oh, brother. He thinks it's hormonal. He asks if Trip was intimate with anyone on the Zerulean ship. Trip is surprised and says he was not. Flox tells him that the bump is a nipple, and the scans show that Trip is pregnant. <sighs> so there are a lot of problems here, and we're not sure where to start. Well, for one, the baby is growing in between the ribs. That would be a terrible place for a human to have a pregnancy. The rib cage isn't really designed to stretch that much. It's got some leeway, but not enough to accommodate a baby. Two. Why is he growing nipples on his wrists when he already has nipples? And three. If the men of this species have nipples for nursing, why do the females have breasts? Four. The human body is not Play-Doh that can mutate at a moment's notice. This is a classic example of writers not understanding anatomy. Five. In humans, the baby grows in the womb where the baby is protected from the mother's immune system. Tripp's immune system should be attacking the zygote and trying to expel it. Six. To be blunt, Tripp was violated. Alon took advantage of his ignorance. She called their mating ritual a game and didn't take any precautions. At best, she's completely ignorant for the welfare of others. At worst, 
She's a predator experimenting on people without their will or consent. And lastly, this whole thing is played lightheartedly, like it's a whoopsie baby. This situation should be frightening, considering this is an alien. Fox then gives more information about the baby. I uh, assume you'll be happy to know that it's not technically your child. What do you mean? When reproducing, these Aurelians only utilize the genetic material of the mother. The males simply serve as uh, hosts. Well, that's a convenient out for one of the moral dilemmas. But wait, if the DNA for the babies comes from just the females, where do the males come from? Archer tries not to laugh at his friend who's just been violated. What a guy. T'Pol is just insufferable. She's like one of those parents that are ready to throw their kids out onto the street just because they made a mistake. She's basically victim blaming, like all this is his fault. For completely unknown reasons, Trip is taking this all very well. Better than I would be, certainly. He doesn't ask to have the pregnancy ended. He is willing to wait until they find the Zerillians and see if they can help. Archer asks T'Pol to start looking for them, and Trip asks if they can keep this pregnancy a secret. Next, we get to a scene that I think is supposed to be funny. Trip seems to be having hormone fluctuations and is more irritable than usual. He's yelling at Ensign, that guy, about design flaws and potential hazards to children that might be aboard the ship. Yucks a plenty here. He points out where the handrail is in a position that could cut someone's fingers off. Ensign, that guy, says... Why would someone put their hands there, sir? Because it's a handrail, you dope. Enterprise spends eight days looking for the Zerillion ship, but have no luck. We then have eating! Again, the third eating scene. While eating, Trip shows Phlox and Archer another nipple he's growing. Again, I'm surprised he's only mildly annoyed by all this. In fact, he seems to be more annoyed that the cat was let out of the bag about his pregnancy than actually being pregnant! Although Trip seems willing to be pregnant, he does not seem willing to be a parent. He shows frustration with the idea of caring for the child once born and raising it. He does not want to give up his career or his position as a chief engineer. This is a common situation that many women face, but see here, ho ho, shoes on the other foot, guys. Oh, very cute, Enterprise. Thanks. I hate it. All right, so Enterprise does eventually find the Zerillion ship. Looks like Trip's repairs didn't hold, so they had to resort to hitchhiking again. This time behind a Klingon battlecruiser. Man, these Zerillians aren't too bright. Archer says they can't get in touch with the Zerillians without the Klingons knowing. I don't know why. Can't they just send a direct message to the Zerillians, not a broad hail? In the three days Trip was on board, no one got their phone number? Anyway, Captain of the Year decides to tell the Klingons that they have a hitchhiker and that ship is responsible for any malfunctions that they're experiencing. The Klingons react with anger and violence. Who could have seen that coming? Archer almost totally loses control of the situation. The Klingons are going to execute almost everyone on board the Zerillion ship, but T'Pol steps in and mentions that Archer was the one who saved Klang and stopped a devastating war between the Klingon houses. She says it would be both honorable and intelligent to comply with Archer's requests, as they owe him one. So this is how they use that get out of Stovacor free card, huh? Trip also jumps in and mentions the Zerillians have a fantastic holodeck. If they let the Zerillians live, they can then acquire this new tech and learn how it works. I don't know why the Klingons couldn't just kill them and take the technology. Also, continuity issues aside, shouldn't the Klingons be more interested in the cloaking technology? So, in order to get the Klingons to not kill everyone on the Zerillian ship, and also take Trip along with them, 
Archer has to disclose personal medical information with everyone on the bridge. After three more hours in that decompression tube with the two Klingons, Trip finally meets up with Alen and shows her his baby bump. She is surprised to see that another species could get pregnant with one of their children. If I'd known... No need. If you had known what? You would have been more honest? You wouldn't have called what you both were doing a game? You would have been more forthright that this was an intimate act? What? She scans the baby and says it's early enough to transfer the child to another host, and also reveals it's a girl. Well, no surprise there, since the DNA only came from the mother. Meanwhile, the Klingons are given a demonstration of the holodeck technology. Now, I can see plenty of uses Klingons would have for this technology. Mapping terrains for battles, basic training, all kinds of uses. I can see my house from here. Oh, good lord. So after the Klingons get their virtual houses, they say that the Zerillians are free to go. Archer makes a show of friendship and the Klingons offer the traditional Klingon response of piss off. Archer, Tripp, and Paul are once again eating. They make some jokes about it, but whatever, we're out of here. Done. This episode has a trope rating of four. One point for Alien of the Week, one point for Freaky Mutations, one point for Highly Questionable Science, and one point for Holodeck Malfunctions, which leads to an unwanted pregnancy. The good. Connor Trenier is giving it his all this episode. Also... A point to the makeup artists. The aliens look pretty decent. Also, Porthos. He's always so cute. The bad. Everything else. Yeah, the horrible implications are completely unexplored. It has terrible science, gross insensitivity to all the characters, and is just plain stupid. It's insulting to the audience and general human decency. Computer, save file, and end transmission. Affirmative. Processing. Terminating. Transmission. Ending. Communication. I can see my house from here. <laughs>